Okay, let's get started. Uh, welcome back to CS206. Uh, before we jump back into lecture, let's talk a little bit about assignment one. And as some of you are discovering the big challenge of assignment one, which is uh, PyroSim installation. So I want to see a few show of hands to get a feel for where we are. How many people have started in on assignment one? That's good. Great. Thank you very much. Um, how many of you have successfully installed PyroSim? Okay, about half of you. Thank you very much. How many of you have unsuccessfully installed PyroSim? Okay, a few people. Okay. Um, how many of you managed, uh, of all of the Windows users that have attempted PyroSim, for how many of you did Plan A work, which was just to use the executables that were in the directory? No? Not a single person. All right, so much for plan A. Good thing we have a plan B. How many success, How many people managed to get plan B to work? The Linux virtual machine. That worked for you on a Windows machine? Excellent. Okay. So a few over here that haven't. Okay. Um, for those of you that haven't, come and see me after class and we'll talk about plan C. All right. Okay. So again, for those of you that have started in on assignment one but have not got to PyroSim yet, please do so as soon as possible. As I said, we're try still trying to iron out the kinks for uh, our Windows users. Sound good? Okay, so uh, back to uh, lecture. Um, we're going to jump back to lecture slide uh, set number one here. We finished talking about logistics. We're going to spend a few more minutes just talking about why we might want to study uh, robotics. Once we, once we finish that, we're going to have a crash course in a history of AI and robotics. Obviously, that could take up an entire course in and of itself. In lecture two, we're going to look at just a few ideas in the early days of robotics and AI to sort of show all the different approaches uh, that have been tried so far to create intelligent machines. And that will help us situate evolutionary robotics in that landscape of all these different uh, approaches. Okay. Okay, so back to lecture one. I think we got as far as slide nine and ten. We were talking about why robots, there's an obvious engineering uh, desire for robotics. If we can get them and deploy them outdoors, we'll be able to create infrastructure and maintain infrastructure uh, much more cost effectively than we do uh, at the moment. Assuming we are able to create autonomous and adaptive machines that can continuously adapt what they do in outdoor environments when the outdoor environment around them changes, why might that be useful? It's always difficult to say. Um, sorry, I'll come back to that in a moment. We did talk about not just the engineering uh, desire for robotics, but also the intellectual allure of robotics, right? There is no guiding principle yet for what makes something or someone intelligent. It is still a relatively mysterious phenomenon. Because we don't have a good handle on what intelligence is, that's making it particularly challenging for us to create intelligent machines. So it's a wide open intellectual frontier. It's also interesting, in my opinion, because it doesn't fall squarely within any of the existing science or engineering or psychological disciplines. Robotics draws on many of them, and obviously we're going to see quite a bit of that in this, this course. Okay, so back to the engineering aspects of robotics. It's possible to tell before a technology is deployed what the killer app will be, but my money's on uh, alternative energy, right? So there's a lot of technologies out there, and they're already starting to become cost-effective. We're just on the brink of solar and wind and wave being able to compete with fossil fuels. The biggest cost at the moment for alternative energy, regardless of whether we're talking about solar farms or wind farms or wave for farms, is what? If you, wanted to, if you want to deploy a large-scale solar farm, what's the biggest cost? Is it the upkeep? How so? Uh, I know a lot of the problems with the renewable energies is it just costs so much to keep like a nuclear plant up to date and up to code and wind farms be up to code. Absolutely. And who keeps it up to date? 
Isn't it the infrastructure? Just not, being able to get the power actually. Not necessarily, no. Because again, who needs to lay the pipe or the wires to do that? The labor. Labor, right? So whether we're building it or trying to pump it out to wherever we're trying to pump it out to or maintain the infrastructure, most of it is done by hand because most of these things are outdoors or in some sort of unstructured environment, right? So unlike a factory, most factories in the Western world that are almost completely automated, if you go and look at a solar farm and, and something is being fixed, there is someone out there fixing it, right? So if we want to bring down the cost of Competi uh, all energy alternative competitors to fossil fuels, we're going to have to try and bring down the cost of labor somehow, and we might be able to do that with, with robotics. So again, I say might, who knows what the killer app of uh, outdoor robotics might, might be. Okay, so why robots? Why robots outside? We're going to focus in this class, obviously, on a particular approach to robotics, which is evolutionary robotics. So why evolutionary robotics? Why take ideas from how Mother Nature has evolved us and other organisms and try and apply that to the creation of intelligent uh, machines? One reason is, is that creating a robot, and you're going to see this today and next lecture as well, is an extremely non-intuitive thing to sit down and to try and create a robot by hand. So most modern approaches to robotics takes a step back where we build part of the machine, and then we use either machine learning or an evolutionary algorithm to automatically optimize some aspects of the robot. In the original days, in the first days of robotics, people tried to, by hand, create all aspects of a robot. It's incredibly non-intuitive. Here's an example. This is the uh, Nanaped. This was a robot that I worked on uh, when I was at Cornell. Here's the nonoped down here. The nonoped is made up of two Stuart platforms, and there's a, a GIF of a Stuart platform running there. So a Stuart platform is an interesting engineering device because as you can see from the uh, animation there, it's made up of two plates, and those plates are attached together with six pistons. You can count them, you can't see the sixth one there, it's hidden behind the fifth one. So you've got these six pistons. Imagine that you have control of the controller. So you can send commands to these six pistons. And let's say we're just going to control these pistons in a binary fashion, meaning at any point in time, T1, T2, or T3, you can send a plus one or a minus one to any one of the pistons. Plus one is a command to lengthen the piston, and a minus one is a command to shorten the piston. So in this animation here, you can see a whole bunch of ones and zeros being sent to the pistons, which causes the upper plate to rotate relative to the lower plate. So far, so good. So we know what a Stuart platform is. We know how to control it. Let's imagine now that, again, we took the nonoped here, we took two of these Stuart platforms, attached them in series. So here's an upper plate, lower plate, upper plate, lower plate. So we now have 12 pistons, right? For each one of those 12 pistons, you have M, or you have 12 motors, M1, M2, and so on. So you can think of the controller, and we're going to get into more and more sophisticated controllers as we go. Let's imagine for the moment our controller is going to be a 12 by, let's say, 200 matrix. So the 200 columns are going to correspond to the 200 time steps that we're going to control this nonoped for. So you can fill in this binary matrix however you want with plus ones or minus ones. And we want the nonoped to go this way. Go. What should that matrix look like? Let's have there a good good answer, right? Not an easy thing to figure out how to how to do this. When we originally built the nonoped. Uh, in 2004, just for fun, we spent about half a day actually trying to fill in some of these matrices to get the nonoped to actually move in one direction. It is 
exceedingly difficult. So again, we applied ideas from evolutionary robotics here. And it's not playing. Bear with me a second here. If I can find it. Okay, so what you're going to watch in this video here is the nonoped in action. So what you're watching here is one of the initial random matrices. So we just created this 12 by 200 matrix and filled it with minus ones and plus ones to start. This is us just kind of exercising a little bit, making sure that our intuitions about general motions worked. Nice rhythmic beat here, but we not do much in terms of getting the robot from point A to point B. It would take evolution long to find something that kind of works. We felt that evolution can also get the amount of fed to move sideways. There's lots of matrices out there that actually do work. So what you're watching is, again, like last time, snapshots from an evolutionary algorithm, right? Matrices that were eventually found by evolution that tended to work. So we know that the nonoped has 12 motors, and we had 200 rows, 200 columns in this matrix. How many possible matrices are there? About 2 to the power of 12 times 200. So a lot of, lot of matrices, right? So again, one of the reasons why we use an evolutionary algorithm is we can't apply brute force search here, right? There's no way we could synthesize and download each of these matrices onto the robot to find the global optimum, which is the one matrix in this set of what might as well be an infinite number of matrices that gets this thing to travel as fast as, as possible. Okay. So, again, we're using an evolutionary approach in evolutionary robotics because we can't just sit down and manually design a controller for a robot. It's too difficult. We're going to have to use some search method to find a good way to control this robot. Okay, that's reason number one. Reason number two is that we can apply a learning algorithm. That's fine, and there are a lot of approaches in robotics that do that, that search or change this controller over time. So as the robot is behaving, it's starting to tune this matrix or tune the brain so it gets better at doing what it does. So that's a learning robot. What we want to try and do in evolution is not assume that we know what the robot should look like. Why two Stuart platforms? Maybe we, if we attached three Stuart platforms in sequence, that might eventually lead to a robot that travels faster than any possible controller for the two Stuart platform nonoped. We might want to consider, as roboticists, changes not just to the brain or the controller of the robot, but also to the body of the robot. But again, Choosing a good body plan for our robot is also very difficult and non-intuitive. So evolutionary roboticists argue learning algorithms are not enough. If you choose the body of the robot and then apply a learning algorithm to its controller, you may have chosen, unbeknownst to you, the wrong body. 
there may be another body out there that is more appropriate for the task at hand. And let's see if this is going to run for me. No, let me see if I can find it. Just bear with me. Uh. <clears throat> okay. This is, a, again, a snapshot from an evolutionary algorithm. This was taken from my PhD work. In this case, I was assuming robots that were made up of connected uh, spheres. You can sort of tell from this video what the fitness function was, which was traveling as quickly as possible into the screen. And you can see from this video that evolution is trying out lots of different body plans. The gray shading or the black and white spheres tells me something about the control inside those spheres. So again, we have the body of the robot, and inside there is some controller that gets it to work. Here's, a, here's one that seems to work pretty well. Here's one that's kind of interesting. It's bilaterally symmetric, so the left side of the body looks like the right side of the body, but that robot never went anywhere, so evolution threw it away. And evolution seems to have found this non-symmetric but locomoting robot. I like to show this video because it also shows that often evolution discovers a body plan that seems, again, not so intuitive. If you were to ask an engineer to sit down and make a robot to get from point A to point B, it's unlikely that they would have made a robot that, that looks like this. Okay. We're going to see, uh, especially towards the later part of the, uh, the course, a lot of experiments, evolutionary robotics experiments, where we're optimizing the body along with the brain. Okay, so two reasons in favor of evolutionary robotics. The third reason is relatively straightforward, right? We would like to make intelligent machines, and some of us would like to try and make machines that are increasingly intelligent, that, intelligent, that they might start to approach human levels of intelligence, right? Is that even possible? Can we make computers or robots that exhibit human levels of intelligence? Hard to say, we don't know the answer to that one yet. But we do have an existence proof that someone was able to produce human level intelligence. It took her 4.5 billion years to do so, but she got there, right? Mother Nature did it. So we do have an existence proof that at least given a palette of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and biological environments, it can happen. So again, in evolutionary robotics, we say if evolution can produce very intelligent entities. Why don't we try and get evolution to do it again, but this time using silicon rather than, than carbon? Okay, third reason for evolutionary robotics. The fourth and final reason we're going to talk about today is a lot of learning algorithms uh, are known as supervised learning algorithms. So a supervised learning algorithm, as the name implies, is that there's a little bit of supervision during learning. So as the learner is trying to learn something, the human or something else is coming in and saying, there's an error in how you're doing things at this point and at this time step. So in my little cartoon example here, again, I'll play this video for you in a moment, you're going to see now a biped or a two-legged robot and it takes a few steps and then falls over, so it's partly optimized. It doesn't quite work well yet. So when it falls over, this biped isn't actually controlled by this controller, but let's imagine it's a simple controller like the one we saw for the nonoped. When the biped falls over, there is nothing we can do to work backwards from the robot falling to say the mistake happened at this motor at this time step. We can't localize where the problem occurred. We just know that the robot fell over. We do kind of know when it fell over, but it's very hard to localize the error. Most supervised learning algorithms, they know where the problem is, and they try and work backwards from that error to correct the error. if I can find it for you. Let's see here.
Okay. So here's, our, here's one evolved biped, and at this point we've managed to evolve it to take a few steps, and over it goes. So if we were to open up this biped and look at the controller, it's impossible for us to know where in the controller the error started from. There is no supervision. So an evolutionary algorithm is often known as a semi-supervised semi -supervised, uh, search method. It's semi-supervised in what sense? There's a little bit of supervision here. We can't actually do full supervision. We can't go into the controller and say the problem occurred here. How is this semi-supervised? You only supervise it um, at the point where there's an error. When there's an error, right? So this biped, I don't know, it took seven or eight steps and, f and fell over. If there was another biped that took nine steps and then fell over, we can provide a little bit of supervision, right? We can say that one is a little bit better than that one. Right? So it's semi-supervised in the sense that in an evolutionary algorithm, for every single robot, we have the fitness function. And that fitness function assigns a single number to that robot, which is how good that robot did at whatever we want the robot to do. So it's semi-supervised. right? You did better. You did worse. We can't tell you where you went wrong, but there's a little bit of supervision there. OK, so that's my defense for evolutionary robotics. As I said, evolutionary robotics is just one particular approach in a very large landscape of the search for intelligent machines. And that's what we're going to switch and talk about uh, today. OK, so uh, lecture two, again, we're going to do a very canned history of AI. Uh, the reading for today is a chapter from uh, the book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. The whole chapter is there. You just need to read uh, pages 5 through 11. If you want to read the entire chapter, uh, by all means, do so. OK. OK, so let's start uh, way, way back with the person that said, Kogito ergo sum. Who was that? He actually didn't say cogito ergo sum. He said, je pense dans je suis. He did not write in Latin. He wrote in French. There's your first hint. Was it René Descartes? I, absolutely. He was, or he believed he was, a man of the people. None of this fancy schmancy Latin. Let's, let's speak in the people's language, which at that time was French. Why the heck in, an, in a robotics course would we go back to René Descartes' time and start with, I think, therefore, I am? Before uh, I take answers to that question, just a little logistics note. As we go through on the lecture slides, you're going to see from time to time these uh, empty red boxes. Um, this is a prod to you to annotate your slides. So again, some of you have a paper uh, version of the slides. Some of you have an electronic version. Um, we're going to fill in what's in that empty box there. You should be annotating that somehow. Uh, if you just have a notebook today, that's fine. You might want to note the slide number and what's in that box. Best thing to do is bring the slides and annotate them as we go. So again, the red boxes are just there as a prod to make sure you're annotating the slides as we go. Okay, so what goes in that red box? We're going to talk about cogito ergo sum here. Where did he develop this idea of I think, therefore, I am? Any philosophy students here? All right, let's take a guess of when he did this. 19th century, 18th century, 17th century, getting close, right? So we're going all the way back today to 1637. So in Discourse on Method, Rene Descartes said, all right, enough is enough. Let's sit down once and for all, and I'm going to try and prove what actually exists. How can I know beyond a shadow of a doubt what exists, right? I open my eyes and I look on all this stuff out here, but that's just my senses, right? My senses are reporting that there is stuff out here. How do I really know, or can I really know, that there is anything out there, right? This was a pretty ambitious project. So, um, again, it's a very subtle argument, and I don't have time to do it justice. 
today, so we're going to do, again, the short form version of this. So I think, therefore, I am. So where does this come from? Where does this statement come from? It comes from the first question, which is, do I exist? My senses tell me that there's stuff out there. I'm part of what's out there. Do I actually exist? I don't know, right? So Descartes started with a huge amount of doubt, right? I don't have any actual proof that anything, including myself, exists. However, if I just consider this sentence, there is a pronoun in this sentence, I. There is something that is asking the question. That I can be pretty sure of. What that thing is and what else exists out there, I don't know. But I am pretty sure that there exists an I. There is something that is asking the question. When I'm feeling intellectually lazy, I call that myself, or in his case, it would have been the soul. Maybe you want to use that term today. We might use the term the mind. But there is something that is asking that question. That surely exists. That thing seems to look out through these portals known as the five senses and sees other things that are out there. But again, those are just senses. There is the thing inside, the eye that's asking the questions and getting reports from outside. But I'm not really sure, right? Maybe my senses are fooling me. There is a tract in here about exactly that, right? You've all seen optical illusions. Sometimes we see things that aren't actually there or hear things that aren't actually there. Senses aren't 100% reliable. How can I really be sure that there's anything out there? So Descartes finished Discourse on Method with kind of a win and a loss, right? He said, there is the soul. There is the I, the thing that asks the questions. That, I am sure, exists. But there is then, at that interface between the I and everything else, there's the body, the thing that's collecting all the information from out there. I don't know if that exists. So starting with Descartes, there was this cleaving of the mind from the body, or the mind from everything else, basically. And this has become known in subsequent centuries as Cartesian dualism, or the mind-body problem. Right? The mind and the body are separate things. And this dates all the way back to Descartes. Why would we care about that in robotics? We're going to see Cartesian dualism cropping up quite a bit throughout this course. And for roboticists, it's been a problem. We keep falling into this trap of thinking of mind and body or brain and body as different things. And it makes things difficult for us as roboticists. You'll see, we'll see this quite a bit as we, as we go. So keep an eye out for Cartesian dualism. All right, so 1600s. Let's fast forward now almost exactly 300 years, actually 299 years to 1936. Um, we are at the uh, beginnings of the Second World War. Uh, Alan Turing, British mathematician, before he got drawn into the war effort, he was think already thinking about, they weren't called computers at that time, but machines. And Turing started to think in his mind, a thought experiment about a machine which didn't exist in reality yet, and of course has become it known in retrospect as the Turing machine. And this Turing machine has certain properties, right? It's a machine that is in the presence of some tape or the environment, if you like. And on this tape, uh, which is broken up into a number of discrete symbols, the machine can do a small number of things. So it can read the symbol at the current location on the tape. So we have the world's first computer input device. right? It reads in what the symbol is. The machine can also have some internal state. These were all brand new ideas at this time. The machine could combine information or its current state with the current symbol, put those two things together, and depending on that, it could do uh, a couple of things. It could update its own state, so change its internal state, the first internal processing of a computer. It could erase the symbol that's there and write a new symbol, or it could either move the tape back and forth, which would be a computer, or it could move itself back and forth, which for us would now be known as a robot. Right? One of the things that distinguishes 
robots from computer is motion, right? You can actually move about in the environment. Okay, so that was the thought experiment known as the Turing machine. Every single computer that's in existence to now, uh, to date, is a physical manifestation of a Turing machine. No matter how sophisticated your computer is, at heart, this is basically what it's, it's doing. There may be multiple Turing machines inside your computer, but that's basically what a computer is, a physical Turing machine. Okay. Uh, Alan Turing, very important uh, pioneer in AI, not just computers, and we'll come back to Turing uh, in a minute. Okay, so that's the 30s. Let's, again, fast forward uh, 20 years now to 1956, and let's travel just down the road from here to Dartmouth College. Um, in the summer of 1956, a number of scientists got together and held a summer workshop on this new kind of computer they had in mind that they called artificial intelligence. So this term AI was invented in 1956 when they were trying to think of what to call this workshop. Right? They wanted to create machines that were intelligent, they weren't biologically intelligent, they were being created by hand, so they're artificial, artificial intelligence. Here's a, a snippet from the proposal that these scientists sent to the government. They wanted a little bit of money to bring in students and house people and feed people for two months. Uh, of course, this is the 50s, so this is a 10-man study, not a 10-person study. Uh, a 10-man study of artificial intelligence will be carried out uh, at Dartmouth. The study is going to proceed on our assumption that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can in principle be so precisely described, this is really important, right? They're going to precisely describe aspects of learning or intelligence, and if we can describe it precisely enough, then we can simulate it. The original AI pioneer said we're going to simulate thinking or intelligence. That's known as the weak AI stance. So people that believe in weak AI believe that computers may be able to sim someday may be able to simulate human level intelligence, but they won't actually be intelligent like we are. Opposed to them are those that believe in strong AI, as you can imagine, which is that machines someday will not just simulate intelligence, but will be intelligence. So they will not just simulate intelligence, but they will be able to reproduce biological intelligence. Okay, we'll leave again that argument aside for the moment. Uh, let's focus on what they were trying to do. They were going to make an attempt to find out how to make these machines, and they were going to get these machines to reproduce, at first, the building blocks of intelligence. And we're going to see that in evolutionary robotics as well. It's very tricky to sit down and say, okay, we're going to evolve an intelligent machine. What would be a fitness function for an intelligent machine? It's very difficult if you sit down and really think about it, how to precisely describe what intelligence is. What's a lot easier is to sit down and think about all the necessary building blocks, right? If you were to someday point at a machine and say, yes, that machine is intelligent, that machine should probably be able to use uh, and generate language. It should be able to form abstractions and concepts. It should be able to sort of do some problem solving, like the kind of problem solving that humans do. And most importantly, improve themselves, right? Whatever we set them to start doing, they should autonomously learn how to get better at it. Okay, so that's what they were going to do. Uh, we think that a significant advance can be made in one or more of these problems if a carefully selected group of scientists, which of course are the 10 signatories to this document, uh, are brought together to work on it for a summer. We'll solve it. We'll solve the language problem. Probably we'll solve abstractions and concepts. Uh, we'll get to human level problem solving. Should take us about uh, two months. <coughs> How'd they do? Right, so what, what are we now? We're uh, 70 years in, 65, 70 years in. So we've been at this for quite a while. Just in the last few years, we've gotten a little bit better at machines that form abstractions. So you can give an image or a photo to a computer and it will abstract away the pixel values from that image and tell you, yes, there is a human in this picture or no, there isn't. 
So I guess we could, you know, you could see that as forming an abstraction. It's a start, right? We're getting better. One of the fascinating things, if you really study the history of AI, is the breathtaking hubris we had at the beginning, right? It's not going to take us long to figure this out. 65, 70 years in, we're barely scratching the surface of being able to even describe what intelligence is and turn it into smart machines, right? AI or intelligence is a much, much more difficult problem than anything humans have come up against so far, right? Perhaps it's going to be solved someday. Perhaps we'll get computers that simulate intelligence or maybe machines that actually are intelligent. It's probably not going to happen in the next few months. Right? So it's a good time to be going into AI. Uh, there's lots to be done. OK. Who actually attended uh, this event? Um, anybody recognize any names on this list? Um, is Alan Jewell, is that, can you come up with a um, type of machine? Uh, yes, he did. So he was one of the first computer scientists and did make some alternatives to that. Other names look familiar? Shannon. Ah, where do you know the name Shannon from? I think it's information engineering. Absolutely. So Shannon actually uh, formulated a mathematical description of what information is, right? So Shannon, along with his colleagues here, they were wrestling with, well, what actually is intelligence? And some of them felt, well, a big part of intelligence is being able to manipulate information, take information in, change it, and put it back out. Shannon said, well, wait a second. We also don't really know what information is, right? What does that mean? So that he was successful in defining. Right? Any other names you recognize? So. Um, uh, John McCarthy was the actual founder and organizer of this event. Uh, he was the one that actually uh, came up with the term AI. Uh, he passed away recently. Uh, Marvin Minsky uh, was, I think, a grad student at the time or was a new professor. He went on to co-found the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, which is basically mecca for all things uh, robotics uh, and AI. Very famous institution. If you get to Cambridge, Mass., um, go have a look at the MIT AI Lab uh, building. When I taught this class last year, on the day we talked about Marvin Minsky, he passed away. So he passed away almost exactly one year ago uh, today. Again, Shannon, the father of information theory. Uh, Herbert Simon actually came from economics and won a Nobel Prize uh, in it uh, several decades later about decision making. So obviously, if you're an intelligent agent, you need to make uh, decisions, and Simon was interested in economic decisions as well. Uh, has anyone taken a course with Prof Professor Skalka here in the computer science department? Professor Skalka was Herb Simon's last uh, grad student, so uh, there's a connection there. If you run into Professor Skalka, ask him about uh, Herb Simon. Okay, so that's sort of where AI officially started, 1956. Um, let's pause in our history for a moment and sort of talk about the goals, right? So in 1956, they said the goal is to sort of isolate these building blocks of intelligence and then turn them into uh, machines. Um, in our book, we try to summarize this as we want to understand biological uh, systems. So for example, how does, an an how does a simple animal, obviously this isn't an animal down here, it's a robot, how does it translate the detection of light? So this robot here is detecting light. And how does it take that detection and turn it into a behavior, which is known as phototaxis? And again, I think in the interest of time, I won't play this video for you. But if I did, you'd see this robot turn and eventually smash into this light bulb here. So phototaxis is go towards the light. How do animals do that, right? If any of you have uh, student kitchens at home and you don't clean them up, there's another animal you'll find in your kitchen that when you turn the lights on, it does the opposite. Photophobia runs into the, the shadows, right? So how does an animal do this? How does an animal either run towards light or run away from it? If we can understand how an animal does that, maybe we can abstract that down into a simple algorithm or a simple design. And here's such an abstraction over here. This is a Breitenberg vehicle. We're going to come back to Breitenberg vehicles in a few minutes. 
Um, here we've got a simple abstracted robot here. It has two light sensors, one on the front left, one on the front right, and two wheels in the back here. And you can see the right sensor is wired up to the left wheel, and the left sensor is wired up to the right wheel. If you, put, uh, if you take a flashlight and shine it towards the robot from its front left, it will turn and smash into the light bulb. Why? So when that left sensor uh, senses more light like the right motor, it turns faster. Absolutely. There's, in this cartoon here, you can see there's more light falling on this sensor than there is falling on this sensor, which means this wheel is going to turn faster than this wheel. It will turn towards the light. And when it turns towards the light, what happens? So a tenth of a second later, it starts to turn towards the light. The light levels balance out. The light levels balance out, and they don't just balance out. We need to think about the robot here and its environment. What else can you tell me about the light levels on these two sensors? Not, well, it depends. If it overshoots, then maybe there's more on the right than the left. Let's imagine that it's turning and facing towards the light now to the point where both light sensors are firing at the same intensity. What else has changed? Not just the balancing out of the intensity. The intensity itself. The intensity itself has gone up, right? The robot has turned towards the light. It's closer to the light. So what is the robot going to do in the next time instant? Speed up. It's going to accelerate, right? A little faster until it smashes into the, the light, right? So if we understand something about how animals do it, maybe we can boil this down to a very, very simple idea that we can then build into a Lego robot or some other robot and get phototaxis. We could twiddle with these two wires and get photophobia. That's the basic idea, right? Start with biology. Start with trying to figure out how animals or evolution does it and work backwards to an intelligent machine. That's one goal of at least bio-inspired approaches to AI. OK, let's go back to history for a moment. Uh, let's go forward a little bit now from 1956 to the mid-60s. And in the mid-60s, AI uh, was taking a particular approach which forgot about uh, biology altogether. So a lot of the original founders said, eh, biology is kind of messy. We don't really know how animals or humans do it. We know how intelligence works. It works like this. They had certain ideas, and they set it up. One of them said, all right, we need a machine that can take in language and produce language. How do we do that? Well, we as humans hear somebody say, um, I'm really upset with uh, my boyfriend, for example. Right? I hear the, uh, a human hears I verb proper noun. And if you want to help out, you might say, why, uh, why are you so upset with your boyfriend? Right? You sort of take the statement and flip it around into a question. So maybe what humans are doing when they enter into a conversation is they hear noun, noun, verb, adjective, adverb. They flip it around. They add some of their own internal state. And they produce a new sentence, which is verb, adverb, verb, verb, noun, verb. Right? So what we're doing is manipulating verbs and nouns and adverbs and that that's what goes on in a conversation, OK? So let's build Eliza. So Eliza was the world's first uh, chatbot. And I think there are Eliza emulators out there on the web. You can go try it out uh, yourself. Uh, Eliza says, I am the psychotherapist. Please describe your problems. Uh, each time you're finished talking, uh, type return twice. So the human says, I have a terrible headache. and Go, and the conversation goes downhill very quickly from, from there. Sometimes Eliza worked pretty well. In some of the initial experiments, people would sit there for hours and pour out their heart to uh, Eliza. It's kind of an interesting psychological or social study, uh, if you like. Uh, Eliza, again, was the first chatbot. You can get on uh, line and try current state-of-the-art chatbots. They don't work very well. Has anyone tried to? A recent chatbot still not very good. Why not? Uh, don't modern chatbots pull from the internet? Sure. Because yes. And so then they also uh, emit all the filth and all the other things you find on the internet, right? Unfortunately. Let's put aside all, all of that part. 
What was the Microsoft one that like immediately turned into a racist? Yes, exactly right. The Microsoft chatbot was the most recent fiasco in the history of, of chatbots. So not only will they parrot back terrible things that they hear on the internet, like others do on the internet. What's the problem there? Did the Microsoft chatbot know that it was offending people based on what it was saying? Well, um, the, there was a problem with uh, users that weren't reliable saying um, like negative comments and jokes towards it, so then it just ended up repeating everything that it heard. A absolutely, right? So not all the human interlo interlocutors or the humans that were interacting with the chatbot were playing fairly. Again, setting aside all of that, they still don't work very well. Why do you think that might be? They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing, right? Is this what you do when you're in a conversation? Do you just take in verbs and nouns and flip them around and combine them with all the other tens of thousands of nouns and verbs that you have in your head and send out a new pattern? Probably not, right? But the tricky thing is, what is the knowing part? What is the additional stuff that we do, aside from just manipulate symbols? Right? This gives you a taste, I hope, for why AI is so difficult. We know that we don't just do this. And we have evidence now that we don't just do this. Because if you do that, even if you draw on the huge data reservoirs that are out there on the net, the chatbots still don't work very well. There's something else, it seems, that we do when we enter into a conversation. But it's very difficult to sit down and try and precisely describe what it is that we do. Now again, there's lots of different opinions in AI. Uh, if you ask some other AI researchers, they might just say, we just don't have enough data. If we get enough data, now the chatbots will start to work. My personal opinion is it's not just a matter of big data. There's something else that's missing. And we'll come back to that when we talk about language uh, towards the end of the course. Okay, so, so this became known as classical AI because it was an attempt to just sort of ignore biology and say, we know how language works and abstraction works. We're just going to build algorithms to do it. And classical AI tended not to get very, very far. Okay, let's come back to Alan Turing uh, for a moment. So Alan Turing, big figure in computer science and AI. We just talked about the Turing machine. Turing is also very famous in AI for coming up with the Turing test. So Turing also entered into all these late night conversations with his colleagues back in the 40s and 50s about what exactly intelligence is. How could you point at an object or a machine or an organism and say, yep, that thing is intelligent? What is the definition of intelligence? And the assigned reading for today is a section on exactly that. Very difficult to define it. So Turing said, let's put all that aside about this whole attempt to try and define what intelligence is. Instead, we're, I, in, from my point of view, it's intelligence as it does, not as it is. So Turing came up with an operational definition of intelligence, which is you can't define it. All you can do is say something is intelligent based on its operations or its actions. So uh, the Turing test says, let's take a machine, or let's take a female who's pretending to be a male, or a male who's trying to be a fe or who's pretending to be a female, or a computer that's trying to pretend to be a human, and we're going to hide that person or machine behind a screen, and you can talk to that machine like you would a chatbot. If you chat to that chatbot for a few minutes you say, I know that's a machine. There's no way that that's a human and it actually is a machine. Then the machine failed the Turing test. But if a machine continues to fool humans into thinking that the human is talking with a human, then the machine has passed the Turing test. And according to Turing, or according to those uh, who believe in the operational definition of intelligence, it is intelligent. Right? Does this only work? Is this like a, it's intelligent until proven otherwise? Like intelligent say, until say, proven otherwise, absolutely. So you're just talking to a person and it's considered intelligent until you can Un say otherwise. Until something starts happening and you say, I don't think there's any one home, right? There's something that's missing. Are you all happy with that definition? 
I see some nods. Anyone not happy with the operational definition of intelligence? Is it enough? Intelligence just seems like a, still seems very vague. See, very vague, right? This is the drawback of the operational definition. There is no definition, right? It just convinced us that, that it is, right? There's something about the Turing test that is somehow unsatisfying. So there's still lively philosophical debate about what intelligence actually is. Yes? I was just going to say, it feels like it's kind of scoped to what it's doing, not to it, intelligence. It is absolutely scoped to what it's doing and not what intelligence actually is, because according to the operationalists, and I'm one of them, there's no better alternative. If someone someday comes up with a very precise description of what intelligence is, I believe a lot of us will leave the operational camp and join the definitional camp. But until then, for me at least, this is the best we can, we can do. There was a short video that I was going to play for you here, but unfortunately the sound isn't there. Uh, anybody speak Spanish? Some of you might have seen me fiddling at the beginning of class. Anybody know what this is from? Blade Runner. This is absolutely Blade Runner. If you have not seen Blade Runner, that's your mandatory homework for, for this weekend. Um, we've got the human over here that's engaged in what seems like a casual conversation with this person over here. It looks like a scene from a crime movie in a police station. Um, the person's asking some odd questions like, if you saw a turtle on its back in the desert, what would you do about it? Seems like kind of odd questions. They're looking to see whether this person's pupils are dilating. This conversation goes on for a while until eventually things go very bad for the person who's asking the questions, but I'll let you go and watch the movie. And in the movie, you can actually watch a Turing test uh, in action. Okay. So that's the Turing test. As I mentioned, not everyone is happy with this operational definition. One of the people that was particularly unhappy with the Turing test was John Searle. And he published in the 1980s <clears throat> a thought experiment, which has become known as the Chinese room problem. Anybody come across the Chinese room problem before? OK. So this was Searle's attack against the Turing test. He said, there's no way that something that passes the Turing test is intelligent. And here's the reason why. OK, so uh, Cyril said, imagine the following experiment. We have a room like you see here. We have a person inside. This person speaks English but does not speak Chinese. I believe we have some people here who speak Chinese and some people who speak English. OK, OK. So, here we go. We've got our person here who speaks English but does not speak uh, Chinese. We have two people outside the room who do speak uh, Chinese. They write a question, like they're talking with a chatbot, in uh, Chinese or Mandarin. My apologies. They pass a piece of paper with the question in Mandarin through this slot in the door, and the person inside receives that piece of paper. That person does not understand Mandarin. All they see is a whole bunch of symbols. And they have a huge book in front of them. And that book is a whole bunch of if-then-else statements. And that book says, if you see this symbol, followed by this symbol, and then this symbol, pull out a symbol from box two and stick it on a second piece of paper. If the next symbol is this, pull out this symbol, and so on. So it's a whole bunch of if-then-else statements that explain how to take the incoming symbols, tra transform them, produce new symbols, and when you're done, pass the new piece of paper back outside the slot. The people outside receive that piece of paper, and that paper is a perfectly cogent response to whatever question they had written in Mandarin. Now obviously, if this conversation goes on for a while, this book is going to have to be pretty big, right? There's going to have to be a lot of if-then-else statements. But Searle said, this is a thought experiment. Imagine the biggest book you want. It doesn't matter, right? The size of the book is not important. Searle said, I, I believe there is a big enough book that you could sustain a conversation, sustain a conversation in Mandarin with these people outside the room for a considerable period of time. 
So this whole room, the Chinese room, passes the Turing test. Is the Chinese room intelligent? So what's the problem here, right? This does seem like a su successful demolition of the Turing test. It seems very process-based. It doesn't have a lot of process. Exactly. That's Cyril's point, right? This is all just cranking it out, right? There's no intelligence going on inside this room. There is a person, okay, and maybe that person is intelligent, but not. they're not applying any of their intelligence to the problem, right? They're just following things through. So if you did believe in the Turing test on this last slide, has Searle unconvinced you of the Turing test? Uh, uh, I think that's, uh, it, it is the, uh, it is the you are looking at the and then you're putting that, uh, that, that person into a room, and then you're putting that part of the room. So the, in the room itself, it's like a system. So you can't call it that. You can't, you can't say that uh, a system that system is, uh, is not intelligent because the person knows that system. It's because the person knows how to, how to solve this problem. Which person? This person? Uh, yeah. But this person is just following along, right? This person could be re replaced by a CPU, right? This person is just following the rules that are written down here. This could be a Turing machine, and this could be a Turing tape. Right? If the tape is long enough, and the machine is fast enough, you could get a machine now, right? We could take the person out of the room, and probably, again, with a long enough tape, get a machine that passes the Turing test. Again, this is all theoretical, right? It hasn't been done, but Searle said in theory it could be done. So if you're an operationalist and you believe in the Turing test, you've got to have a problem with this, right? You have something that seems to not be thinking, passing the Turing test. So you're saying just because it's only following like a preset of rules <coughs> that because it can't necessarily come up with anything new and creative on its own, that's why it's not intelligent because it's literally just it can only make combinations from what already exists. So I'm trying to speak on behalf of Searle, and I believe Searle's answer to your question would be what your, his answer to your question would be correct. There's no creativity here. There's just rule following, right? But it's rule following that following that passes the Turing test. And Turing said anything that passes the Turing test is intelligent. But most people would say this is not intelligence. So for Searle, Searle said the Turing test is not sufficient, right? It's too easy. There are things that can pass the Turing test that are not intelligent. So he just essentially uncovered one of the biggest problems is understanding semantics. So we're back to this problem, right? So Searle would say, yeah, OK, this thing is just following rules. It's not creative. It's missing, again, some stuff, right? But what is that additional stuff? Right? Think about the, the Chinese room as your brain. Right? If somebody asks you a question in, in a language you understand, and you answer them, what was going on inside your head? Was there something in your head going on above and beyond just a whole bunch of complex processing? Were you taking input, what you heard, right? You got the piece of paper through the slot, or you heard uh, the question. You did a whole bunch of processing internally, and then you produced a new piece of paper that you passed out of the slot, which is you talking and answering the question. Are you doing something more than this? I mean, at the same time, like every character or word has its own like meaning to process, and then by your own kind of will and what you kind of determine as the meaning of it, uh -huh. you put every every person puts together their own kind of consensus on what the correct response or what uh, what's the correct path to kind of go about this. So okay. there's no set instructions more you kind of self determine what instructions uh, are in advance. Oh, okay, so you mentioned will in there, right? I determine, I choose what symbols to give back, right? So maybe there's some aspect of will here, right, in decision making above and beyond the Chinese room. So uh, as always, the Chinese room discussion could go on for hours and hours. We're going to have to cut this off at some point. What I'd like you to take away from Searle and Turing today is, is your own impression of it, right? There is no one right answer. 
I am a staunch operationalist. I believe in the Turing test. I don't think there is anything more going on inside than this. There's just a whole bunch of this. It's very complicated. And when you introspect, you think about what you yourself is, are doing, we come up with explanations, right? I'm doing this other stuff that is not going on in the, in the Chinese, Chinese room. Maybe yes, maybe no. I don't think so. I think it's a lot of complex processing. We don't know. Again, intelligence is mysterious. We don't know what's going on in here. We know there's a lot of electrical activity between 10 to the 11 neurons and 10 to the 14 synapses. But what those neurons and synapses are doing, we're not quite clear. Until we're clear, it is just a philosophical discussion. right? We can have our different opinions about what intelligence is and whether the Turing test is sufficient to measure uh, intelligence. OK. So let's move on from the Chinese room now, moving forward again into the 1980s. And we now come up against another staunch operationalist, uh, Valentino Breitenberg. Uh, Breitenberg was a neurophysiologist, meaning he studied the physiology or the structure of uh, brains, animal brains. His particular organism that he worked on is the fruit fly, which is this teeny, teeny, tiny fly. If there was a piece of rotten fruit in the back corner of the room there and you let a fruit fly go, it would uh, fly around and eventually find the rotten fruit and start eating it. Um, in the 70s and early 80s, Breitenberg was reading papers about this, and there are all these theories that fruit flies were performing differential calculus and doing 3D coordinate transforms to figure out the direction they should fly to get to the fruit. Meanwhile, Breitenberg is actually dissecting fruit fly brains. If you've ever seen a fruit fly, you know how small they are. Imagine the size of their nervous system. He was pretty sure there was no differential calculus or 3D coordinate transformations going on inside this, this circuit. He was pretty sure that, like we were just talking about, people were attributing additional stuff to the fruit fly that he was pretty sure was not going on. So he stepped back from fruit flies, and he wrote this very interesting book called Vehicles. It's only, I think it's less than 100 pages. Um, it's an easy read. Um, and he wrote it like a fairy tale, where he said, once upon a time, there was vehicle one, and vehicle one, dot, 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 and he explains what vehicle one does. We'll talk about vehicle one in a moment. He used the term vehicle because he wanted to be agnostic. He wasn't talking about animals. He wasn't talking about humans. He wasn't talking about machines. So he picked another noun, vehicles. And he described, again, these hypothetical vehicles. Vehicle one is pretty simple. It has a sensor, uh, it has a heat sensor on the front and a single wheel on the back and one wire connecting them uh, together. So like we saw in the other Breitenberg vehicle, if you were to release this vehicle uh, into a pond, for example, you might say that it's restless and doesn't like warm water. But it's quite stupid since it is not able to turn back to the nice cold spot it overshot in its rest restlessness. So it slowed down, but once it uh, came out of the uh, once it came out of the warm spot, it sped. Or sorry, cold spot does not like warm water, right? So uh, it slows down in the cold, right? A temperature sensor in cold is firing more slowly, which means the wheel turns more slowly, which means the vehicle moves more slowly through cold patches and speeds up in warm patches. But it's stupid because it can't turn around and go back to the cold patch that it clearly liked because it was slowing down in the cold spot. Anyways, you might say, uh, you would say it's alive since you've never seen a particle of dead matter move around quite like this. This is a world-renowned scientist talking in this manner. Why? Why is he talking like this? I just had a question about stupid. Oh, the yes. Word stupid. Is yes. stupid the counter to intelligence? Because based on the previous thing, if assuming the man in the room knew the que answers to every question in the world, he's He'd be intelligent. Not stupid. That, would, right. that would be considered intelligent. Yes. I wouldn't say stupid would be a good counter to the word intelligent. That's true, right. So I don't think he's using it in that way. He's using the word stupid for another reason, but not that reason. Is vehicle one stupid? Is it restless? OK, I see a couple nods. Some people say yes. Anybody say no? Why no? Uh, because it's not alive. It's not alive, right? Clearly, this is a machine. We know one sensor, one wire, one wheel. 
There's no way, right? Okay, let's shelve that for a moment. Let's have a look at, uh, in uh, vehicle two, there's actually two of them. There's 2A and 2B. I guess this is 2B here. Okay, so 2B, Breitenberg called the aggressor. And we already saw the aggressor, right? Two light sensors on the front, two wheels on the back, and crossed wires. Why is it the aggressor? Because if you put a naked light bulb anywhere near it, it will turn towards it and destroy it. The aggressor hates light, or it hates light bulbs, right? It's a bully, it's an aggressor. Does vehicle two hate? I see a lot of shaking heads. Why not? It's, it's still not alive, right? It's ridiculous. We hate, but these things don't, right? We're different. Um, but aren't these just black, these sensors black boxes for our senses, just simplified into something we don't necessarily, well, some, in a simpler sense? They're certainly simpler than us, right? You've got more than two wires in it's here. Breaking down like a complicated system of us into just a simple sensor and electrical term. All it is is sensors, or senses if you like, and motors, or muscles if you like, and two wires, or synapses if you like, right? Vehicle could be a machine, sensors, motors, and wires, or it could be an organism, senses, muscles, and synapses. Either way, it doesn't hate, right? Okay. Vehicle 2A uh, is exactly like 2B. Two light sensors, two wheels, but now the wires are uncrossed. So if we came at this robot from the, with a flashlight from the top right, what will this robot do? Where will it go? Okay. It'll go away, right? It'll turn to the left. Because more light is falling on the right sensor, which means the right wheel turns faster, and it will run away from the light, right? So vehicle 2A is the coward, right? If you chase it with a flashlight, it'll run away. It, it's afraid of light. Does the coward fear? Of course not, right? That's ridiculous. We fear. We hate. We are sometimes restless. We're sometimes stupid, right? We're different, right? Okay, why is Breitenberg using this kind of language? Why would a trained and world-renowned scientist call something like this the aggressor and the coward? Just to describe their behavior? Okay, but he knows that they, they don't, right? Why would he do this? To show how silly it is. <clears throat> silly in what sense? That, like... It's not actually afraid of the light, it's just turning away from it. Absolutely, right? It's so silly, but why is he making that point? If you read this book, you will react to it, right? Say, this is ridiculous. What is he talking about? So just because it's more simplistic than that, and we try to anthropomorphize bringing a lot more emotion and higher learning or higher thinking. So you mentioned anthropomorphization, right? It's a mouthful, but we're going to hear that word quite a bit in this, this course, right? Which brain is, which, which set of brains is Breitenberg really talking about in vehicles? The brains inside the vehicles? Which brains? The human brains and, and the human brains of, of those that are reading this book, right? He knows how you're going to react. You're going to say, this is ridiculous. And he's going to know why you think it's ridiculous, which is you saying, I have emotions, I fear, I, I have aggression, I have a friend, and I've seen that friend be afraid and be aggressive and so on and so forth. We're different, right? This, this thing, I don't know why he's saying that. <coughs> What's next? If you claim you're different, if Breitenberg were here, what would he say to that? Isn't your brain just composed of more wires than yours? It certainly is, right? So we have 10 to the 11 neurons in our brain and 10 to the 14 synapses. So there's one clear difference. We got more wires. Right. But well, isn't that part of the argument that couldn't you just create something with more wires and motors and connections? Exactly. <clears throat> so Bradenberg could make a, a vehicle out of 10 to the 14 wires and make the same silly argument, and you would react in the same way and say, this person is being ridiculous. Well, you would say, if you're so different, like, Something, like, if you're different, you go. 
he might say that, right? What he'd probably say is, you're so different, tell me how you're different. And your first response would usually be, I've got more wires than a vehicle, right? You'd say, great, here's a vehicle with 10 to the 14. Now how are you different? Now what's your answer? The, I think it'd be more, what's the minimum number of wires to be considered that? That might like, be your you can, answer, right? You so can maybe still see a dog, and a dog, I think, has less, but you can still see fear and stuff in a dog. Right. Emotion. You definitely don't need 10 to the 14, right? Pick an animal that you're pretty sure has emotions, at least from ob observations of its behavior. If you don't want to consider a fruit fly, which has less, but you want to consider a dog, what's the animal that's right on the bare minimum? And are we all going to come up with the same animal? Probably not, right? So there's already problems that are starting to occur here. And even in biopsychology, they say that you can't definitively say whether or not a dog has fear or, you know, feels love. Or Why whatever, not? Which is because we're using our own definitions of intelligence to describe and it. We don't know what's going on inside, right? We see an animal exhibiting <coughs> the, the physical manifestations of what looks like emotion in the same way that I might see my human friend give the physical emanations of emotion, but I've never seen inside the head of my friend. All I have to go on is the Turing test. My friend has acted in all the ways that I've known him or her consistently in a way that I consider that there is someone home upstairs, right? I mean, I would say that if you did polygraph the test, you would see that if you did put in more wires and connections, you could technically see fear. Because, like, say if you were able to perfectly recreate, like, say, a human body, and just this was its only function is to, you know, walk away from a light source. And what some of the connections was when it uh, senses more light, it, you know, triggers more synapses and changes the face uh, structure to uh, resemble fear. Okay, right, so... Then all we're seeing is fear in that. Right, the only fear we see in the vehicle is running away from the light, right? We don't see a, a, a human facial expression. So we could put a face on our vehicle and do all of that. Would you be happy then? Would you say, yes, okay, now that vehicle is like us? Yeah, but we don't know exactly what's going on. So, I mean, if we see someone, say, through a window and they look like they're scared, we can tell that they're scared. Can you? Couldn't I put a vehicle outside and... and Perform the Turing test. If you well, were to look at a human, and that human could essentially be a vehicle, but I don't know. Ah, okay, right. So this was Breitenberg's main point, right? This whole lovely fairy tale, which is fun to read, becomes increasingly uncomfortable to read because he's prodding you, right? He knows how you're reacting to his language and knows that you're claiming mentally that you're different, and he pushes you to find it very difficult to come up with exactly what it is that separates us from a vehicle, right? Again, we're in the philosophical part of evolutionary robotics here. You may leave today being sure that you are different from a Breitenberg vehicle, and that's perfectly fine. What I do want you to leave with today is the sense of how difficult it is to really articulate how we're different from a vehicle, which is no different from saying, what is intelligence. Okay, I think we will leave it there. You have a quiz due tonight, um, and again, your first assignment is due Monday night. For those of you that are having installation headaches, uh, come and see me. The TA has office hours from 11 to 1 p.m. today in Mansfield, room 9. Go and see Kevin at TA. He might be able to help you with installation. Thank you.